Can I uh, start by acknowledging my friend and uh, long-standing Fred, uh, Fred Nile, and thank you very, very much, Fred, for all the wonderful work that you've done uh, in this space. Uh, later, you'll also be joined by another dear friend of mine, Tanya Davies, who's been uh, doing uh, a lot of work up lately, particularly in relation to defending family values uh, here in New South Wales. Can I thank uh, and acknowledge Charles Newington, the Federal Director of Family Voice uh, Australia, and to Greg Abonda, thank you so much for the invitation to speak uh, today. This is indeed a timely conference at a critical time in the history of church and state in Australia. With Federation in 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act of 1900 stated, the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal Commonwealth. 231 years later, faith in a culturally diverse Australia consisting of 25 million people is still very important and the centre of many people's lives. In the 2016 census, 60% of respondents identified themselves as belonging to a religion and 30% not having a religion. As to the other 10%, I don't know, perhaps they're just confused. <laughs> now, in our constitution, the only section that relates to religion is section 116. And it states, the Commonwealth shall not make any laws for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. Now protections for religious freedom are weak in Australian law. Discrimination against individuals on the basis of religion is unlawful in some states, but there are exemptions where indirect discrimination can be justified if it is reasonable. A tribunal or court will decide what is reasonable. And as you were aware, and as John uh, indicated in the opening, I recently launched a petition calling for a Religious Freedom Act, enshrining uh, in that act should be the right to the freedom of speech, thought, conscience and religion. I have been heartened by the many people who have called my office and who have supported my initi initiative and who are actively engaged in getting signatures. And this includes not only people of faith, but those who have no faith, but who do believe in freedom of speech. Because this is an issue primarily about freedom of speech, of which religious freedom is a component. And the current debate has its genesis in what is happening at the moment, has its genesis uh, in the same-sex marriage postal survey which was conducted in 2017. Mm -hmm. I and others warned at that time that religious freedom issues needed to be considered due to the significant and complicated legal consequences of same-sex marriage. These warnings were ignored, and now we are trying to unscramble the egg. I believe a Religious Freedom Act would ensure consistency and applicability across all arms of government across Australia. And when freedom of speech, thought, conscience and belief is framed only as an exemption to other rights. They are read down against positive rights, rendering them subordinate to those other rights. Now, a regime of positive rights in the form of religious freedom legislation would give greater effect to the right to manifest one's freedom of thought, conscience, uh, belief and speech as outlined under Article 18 of the International Covenant of, on Civil and Political Rights, to which we are a signatory. Following the release of the religious um, discrimination, the draft religious discrimination bills, it is clear from my ongoing consultations and engagements 
with religious leaders that the bills fall far short of properly and fully addressing their requirements for religious freedom protection. They want a positive right that allows people to live in accordance with their convictions. And whilst religious leaders may have theological differences, there is a strong solidarity amongst them, unified in their fight to protect freedom of speech and freedom of religion. The need for positive religious freedom laws is due to the growing body of cases in Australia of people facing harassment, intimidation and persecution because of their religious beliefs and actions. Some are even losing their livelihoods. Organisations such as Australian Christian Lobby and the Institute for Civil Society have been cataloguing the growing number of cases of religious discrimination and religious freedom incursions in recent years. In addition, organisations such as Human Rights Law <coughs> Alliance have been busy fighting for and defending the rights and religious freedoms of individuals and organisations in various courts throughout Australia. We are all familiar with the current uh, issue of Israel Folau, and we're also familiar with previous cases such as efforts to deregister Dr Pansy Lai or boycott products uh, made by Cooper's Brewery due to their perceived views of not supporting same-sex marriage. However, there have been a plethora of other cases, not only here in Australia, but in the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States of America. And whilst these cases in Australia have not attracted as much attention, they are just as important to be aware of. They have not been reported in the mainstream media and alarmingly continue to increase in frequency. The education system has become a battleground for students and teachers because they dare to profess their faith or express an alternative point of view. For example, I just want to just share just a few examples. Barry, and that's not his real name, is a lecturer at a tertiary institution. He was officially warned by his employer not to share his religious beliefs about Jesus and threatened with discipline and employment termination. The Barry has sought legal assistance to protect his employment and that case is ongoing. Clara, not her real name, is a mental health counsellor who dared to share her Christian views on sexuality and gender via social media. Consequently, a progressive, progressive, we love that word progressive, don't we, in inverted commas, political activist complained that she lost her teaching qualification. She has been denied her livelihood. Ryan, not his real name, was a general manager in a digital services agency in Victoria. When Ryan was asked about the Safe Schools Coalition, he stated gender fluidity and sexual diversity conflicted with his values. As a consequence, his employment was terminated because his comments created an unsafe workplace. And whilst Ryan was success, uh, successfully pursued legal action against his employer, one can imagine the stress and potential financial uh, loss that he suffered. Maria, not her real name, is a medical uh, general practitioner. She is a doctor who has conscientious convictions uh, about various issues, including family and bioethics. Maria was approached by a couple wanting to utilise IVF fertility services to conceive a child. Maria explained such medical procedures are not within her area. The couple requested a referral to see another doctor, which Maria declined. Consequently, the couple lodged an official complaint against Maria with the medical board. They alleged she unfairly discriminated against them in her practice of medicine. Now, she sought legal advice from the Human Rights Law Alliance. The medical board ruled the complaint was without basis. Now, this is an important win for the freedom of conscience of doctors. It is important to highlight that the current provisions 
of the New South Wales abortion bill would oblige doctors to make referrals like happened in Maria's case. In 2016, the Sydney University Evangelical Union, as part of their membership declaration of faith, stated that, and I quote, in the Lord Jesus Christ as my saviour, my Lord and my God, uh, unquote. Consequently, the University of Sydney Union threatened to deregister the organisation if it did not remove their declaration of faith. Now, following consultation with several faith-based organisations on campus, the University of Sydney agreed to amend the union regulations, allowing faith-based declarations as a condition of membership. Now, notwithstanding that, the Sydney um, Evangelical University, uh, the Sydney University Evangelical Union, was intimidated for their beliefs. Now, I provide another very sad case. A couple wanted to provide the gift of happiness to a child with no parents. Chris and Mary, not their real names, are Christian parents who made an application to foster young children. Consequently, the Child Foster Agency denied their application due to their orthodox Christian views on gender and sexuality being classified as, I quote, unsafe. These examples demonstrate the same characteristics. The victims innocently exercising their rights to express their freedom of speech, conscience, thought and religion. Now, on the other hand, we are seeing the steady and relentless incursion on religious freedom by the left in Australia. Today, I read in my uh, media this morning, as I was coming here, that a former teacher at Ballarat Christian College, backed by Equality Australia, has lodged a claim with the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal alleging discrimination over her support for same-sex marriage, notwithstanding that there were clear provisions in the school's enterprise agreement. Doesn't that sound very, very familiar? Now, future cases like this are not going to disappear with the enactment of the Religious Discrimination Act. That's what I fear. These unfortunate cases, I believe, can only be averted with the enactment of a full suite of religious protection provisions in a Religious Freedom Act. Now, protection for religious freedom is afforded under international law. And the most important uh, multilateral treaty is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which came into force in 1976. Now, let me take you back to the same-sex marriage uh, debate. Many Australians voted yes for same-sex marriage on the clear understanding that religious freedoms would be protected. At a speech at the National Press Club in 2015, I foreshadowed that in a culturally diverse and religiously diverse Australia, many areas where these communities are strong would vote against same-sex marriage. And this was indeed the case. Of the 17 federal electorates that voted no, 12 were in New South Wales, with the majority falling here in Western Sydney. Eight of the top 10 voting, no voting seats were Labor Hill seats. At the time, Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten uh, said trust us on freedoms and vote yes to same-sex marriage. At the time, concerned coalition backbenchers like myself put and supported various amendments. The coalition was at least afforded a conscious vote. Labor opposed all the amendments without a conscious vote and all the amendments were defeated. In the House of Representatives, only four members of Parliament of 150 members voted no. Yep. Many who advocated and indicated to their constituents and their religious leaders that they supported the family did not have the courage of their convictions yeah. and publicly stand up for what they believe in. I want you to remember. In the Senate, I was only one of 12 of the 76 senators who voted no. Indeed, I was the only Liberal minister in the Turnbull government to vote no. You can appreciate 
the effect, the potential effect that that's had on my career. But I was very, very proud to do so, and I would do so again. Now today, this is having repercussions with religious leaders, because once bitten, twice shy. But I will come to that a little bit later. Now, after the same-sex marriage vote, the Ruddick Inquiry uh, was established and undertook their consultations over the Christmas New Year period, when many Australians, especially those of family and faith, are holiday, on holidays enjoying valuable time with their families. The time for lodging submissions was totally inadequate, and I lobbied and managed to get a short extension of time for lodging those submissions. Now, the report was delivered in May 2018, but not released until details were leaked during the Wentworth by-election later that year. Now, the leak, as we know, surrounded the issue of gay children allegedly being expelled from schools. Now, this forced the Coalition to respond, and the advent of bills in both Houses of Parliament calling for the abolition of exemptions under the Sex Discrimination Act for religious education in schools, colleges and religious bodies. This was followed last year and earlier this year by a Senate inquiry into the removal um, of exemptions under the Sex Discrimination Act. Now, the Senate received 9,000 submissions against what, what became known as the Wong Bill. Now, during this time, I was able to meet with many religious leaders who additionally activated thousands of people in the wider community. Now, the Senate released its report in February this year, recommending no changes to the Sex Discrimination Act, that the exemptions to religious bodies and educational institutions be maintained, and that the matter be referred to the Australian Law Reform Commission for consideration. Now, just prior to the coalition going into uh, caretaker uh, government, the uh, Attorney-General referred certain matters to the Australian Law Reform Commission for examination. Consequently, as I predicted, we are now attempting to unscramble the egg. As we are witnessing right at this moment, it is a very unsatisfactory and messy process. Now, even before the federal election campaign started, Australia's uh, first Pentecostal Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, created an expectation that he was a politician uh, of faith. On the 2nd of February, 2019, in an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, he stated, and I quote, it's an incredibly important part of who I am, and that's why I've never hidden it, unquote. During the Canberra's, uh, in the leaders' debate in Canberra at the National Press Club on the 8th of May, he stated, free speech is one of our fundamental freedoms, so is religious freedom. I feel this very strongly. I mentioned it in my first speech, my maiden speech to the Parliament. If you're not free to believe, then what are you free to do in this country? Unquote. During the election campaign, the advent of the Israel Folau issue only deepened the concerns of Australians for family and faith. At the kitchen table, Australians of family and faith asked themselves, what if I say something about my religion? Will I find myself in trouble? If this can happen to someone like Israel Folau, easily happen to me. Now the coalition won the election. Yes, the Prime Minister ran an excellent campaign, but he was able to do so because of Labor's done policies on negative gearing, on franking credits, on the assault, on the coal industry, but also about concerns about religious freedom, which manifested itself in that sacking. This was, I believe, the sleeper issue in the campaign. Quiet Australians, that silent majority, rejected these policies and returned the coalition to power. And as a consequence, the strong perception was that Scott Morrison, rather than Bill Shorten, would protect religious freedom. Many of those quiet Australians who voted for the coalition, especially 
in culturally and religiously diverse communities in what is termed Labor's heartland seats in Western Sydney did so in the expectation that their religious freedoms would be protected. Now, a week before the election, there was a YouGov Galaxy poll which suggested that more than 80% of those surveyed believed that one's beliefs, conscience and values should be protected. Now, the results of the 18 May election showed strong swings against Labor in Western Sydney of up to 7% in some seats. And what is even more remarkable, that these swings happened and went to Liberal uh, Party candidates who had only been in the field for a short period of time. Most especially, these seats were the same seats that strongly voted no in the same-sex um, marriage postal survey in 2017. And it is clear that Scott Morrison's public show of faith has led to this expectation amongst the electorate of the need to protect religious freedom. And now I say this because there is now greater pressure on the coalition government to, return, to defend and protect on this expectation so that we can retain the electoral support that we were given at the last federal election. Now, the test of whether those expectations have been fully met will depend on what those religious leaders advise their congregations. Their views will be paramount in influencing the views of their flock in the lead up to the election. Having been bitten once during the same-sex marriage debate, they will be shy in accepting the same assurances from politicians this time. In short, at that kitchen table, Australians of faith and family have to know, have to be assured that if they quote their Bible, they will not be in trouble. That is now the test, I believe, for politicians in Australia and any doubt in their minds or in the minds of the constituents will have, I believe, political ramifications. Now, following the release of the religious discrimination bills, uh, we are embarking now on a further period of consultation with the Attorney General is. Uh, now, the bills deal with discrimination on the basis of religious belief, but only in key areas of public life. They do not create a positive right of free, uh, to freedom of religion, which the religious leaders, experts and stakeholders have been calling for and which meet international obligations. Now, I envisage that the response to these bills will be on two levels, the technical and the political. Religious leaders, experts and stakeholders will carefully examine the bills in the context of their activities, depending on whether they operate schools, universities, theological uh, training centres, aged care, uh, preschool, hospitals, uh, and there will be careful analysis uh, by them to show, uh, to ensure that their circumstances are covered. Now, I am sure in due course that they will provide a considered uh, response, noting in particular that religious institutions or many religious institutions in this country operate nationally, yet they are subject to different discrimination laws at state and territory level. As I indicated, uh, my ongoing discussions um, indicate that the bills do not meet the expectations of religious leaders and do not meet our obligations under international law. Now, there are some problems with these bills and I just want to highlight just a, a few of those. Um, there is no mechanism for dealing with clashes of competing rights, especially um, those under, uh, and especially given our obligations under international law. And without this, it will be left to the courts. And given our experiences, I have to say, the courts are not necessarily sympathetic to religious views. The inclusion of what are termed the Syracuse principles in relation to balancing the right to religious freedom with other rights and interests, I think, is critical. There are definitional issues in relation to uh, what is a religious belief or activity. Um, 
at the moment it is restricted to lawful religious uh, activity. Now, this limitation extends to criminal and civil law. So, uh, hence, there are, un, uh, there are unlawful, it would be unlawful according to civil law uh, and other regulatory matters. So, what may happen is if a state or council <coughs> decides that they want to enact laws or ordinances making innocuous religious activities unlawful, for example, such as banning the distribution of leaflets or something along those lines, um, that will have ramifications because it's a civil act. Now, we know that clearly there is an intention to ensure that criminal activity is unlawful. So that, I think, has opened up a, a major gap. It also means that uh, faith-based um, aged care facilities or hospitals, which are required uh, to meet certain state uh, obligations, uh, may not necessarily be uh, protected under the bills as they stand. And we know things like euthanasia uh, or other, uh, and I'll come to issues in relation to medical practitioners uh, in a moment. Um, it could also mean uh, that state governments could make funding of religious schools conditional on the schools not teaching their views of marriage or sexuality. And despite the assurances that are given, I think we all know that this could be a possibility. Now, the definition of what is a statement of belief puts too much power, I think, in the hands of judges to decide theology. And there is a limitation to a belief that may reasonably be regarded as being in accordance with the doctrines, tenets, beliefs or teachings of religion. Now, the bills contain, the bills are very, very, it's, they're very long. So it's a quite, a, it's a very complex area of law. There are a couple of provisions which I do want to highlight. Uh, section 8, which is now the Falau Clause, and Section uh, 41, which has been referred to as the Cordius Clause. Mm -hmm. Now, these, the protection under these clauses uh, will not be afforded to a statement of belief which is malicious or that would or is likely to harass, mm -hmm. vilify or incite hatred or violence against another person or group of persons. Now, the use of the word vilify is too wide and will lead to uncertainty. Now, the definition of what constitutes vilification is highly contested <coughs> and has consistently been used uh, by the left uh, to censor. And, for example, it was alleged that Falau's citing of the Bible was vilification. And those who subscribe <coughs> to alternate views on gender, sexuality and even same-sex marriage, and we've heard them, frequently attack us for our views, saying that they're harmful and that they vilify. So you can appreciate that the use of the word vilify in these two sections um, is a serious risk and, in my view, um, should be uh, removed. And, of course, um, on a related matter, there needs to be a clarification that statements, simple statements of belief cannot constitute vilification. There are a raft of other issues which uh, time preclude me uh, from going through. Uh, and um, these are all issues that people like myself said during the same-sex marriage debate. You cannot deal with same-sex marriage without dealing with these issues. No, we were told, no. And so now we are finding ourselves in this difficult situation. For example, there is not at present clarity on the issue of whether ministers of religion may refuse to solemnise solemn, marriages where the marriage is of two persons whose biological sex is identical and where one or both of the parties now has a gender identity or legally recognised sex that differs from their biological sex. Um, there are faith groups that are asking us to cover the field when it comes to religious discrimination so that where there is inconsistency between state and federal law when it comes to religious discrimination federal law prevail now all of this has created more inconsistency um, which in my view needs to be resolved so at the moment what do we have we've got the draft bills 
We've got the Australian Law Reform Commission over there looking at certain things. You've got this whole body of state law over here. And then in the middle of this, you're going to drop federal legislation, which may or may not protect in certain areas. So what do we have at the moment? We have, I think, a real mess. And this is why I believe we do need a Religious Freedom Act to give national consistency and applicability, but above all, to give us certainty in this very, very complex area. So, where to uh, from here? Um, I would urge as many people as possible to ensure that you put in a submission uh, to uh, the bills uh, through the uh, Attorney General's Department and those submissions close on the 2nd of October and there will not likely be any extension. So submissions have to be in uh, by the 2nd of October. Now, again, it is so unfortunate that a complex area like this has only been given five weeks for public uh, submission. And so therefore, um, we really do need uh, to move and move quickly. After that, the bills will be finalised um, they'll go through the process, they'll go through Cabinet, uh, the Coalition Backbench Committee, the Coalition Party Room. If, a, the, if approved, the bills will go uh, and be debated in the House of Representatives. It will be interesting to see um, what happens there. If they pass, the bills will go to the Senate for debate. And as part of that process, the Senate uh, may vote to refer the bills to the Senate Legal and Constitutional uh, Legislation Committee. Now, the government does not control the numbers uh, in the Senate, and all of this will be at the mercy of the Labor-Green Alliance and the crossbenchers. Now, the Senate, if it does go to an inquiry, will also call for submissions and public hearings. And then after that process is over, there will be a recommendation in relation to whether those uh, bills will be passed and any amendment by any senator will be considered and voted on. So, what can you do? Now, Michael Andeljowski... 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 Thank you. ...has his great seven simple steps and he's got copies and he's going to give you those. Can I just touch on um, three um, immediate ones? First of all, please uh, put in a submission and there'll be details in relation, I'm sure, as to uh, how you can do that. Secondly, knock on the door of your local federal member of parliament or senators. Tell them what you think. Do not rely on somebody else to do it. Do it yourself. And tell them you're not happy, you're not happy, uh, with, the, with the bills and what you perceive to be the shortcomings of these bills and, what, and that, the fact that you want robust religious protections in this country. Thirdly, if you would, uh, I urge you to sign uh, my religious freedom uh, petition, which I launched in July. Um, and Najee from my office uh, is available here. And